the greenhouse stage for a fun-filled presentation with a presenter who has been presenting at the Flower and Garden Festival for 13 years. Please welcome the director of the City of Orlando's Harry P. Lou Gardens, Robert Bowden, as he presents Step Up to the Plate with Vegetables. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't hear you over here. Come on. You get a little story, sure, yeah? What about over here? Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. What a beautiful day at the Flower Festival at Epcot. Thank you for coming inside, but it's so pretty outside. Didn't they do a wonderful job out there? Yeah. Every year it gets better. How about that new entrance? Huey Dewey and Louie and Donald Duck? Oh, boy, that looks fabulous. What do you think about a round of applause for the horticulture staff, huh? Every year I see it, I say, you know, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. And I say to myself, every year they can't possibly get any better, and every year they do. Yep. See a lot of friendly faces, a lot of familiar faces today. We are going to talk about growing vegetables today. And throughout the next two or three hours, we're going to be... <laughs> right? Okay, I thought so. I was just... We're going to talk about stepping up to the plate with vegetables. First of all, we're going to talk about two primary themes as we talk about food down, down the next uh, few minutes. Well, number one, we're going to talk about bold flavors. Avocado, tomatoes, those flavors are gone. Wishy-washy. Peas, not enough flavor. We're talking bold here. We're talking fennel, chives, onions, hot peppers. Do I like hot peppers? No. But we, we grow hot peppers. Calif uh, Carolina Reaper, 1.8 Scoville units. Can't touch it with your bare hands. That's the kind of bowl that we're going to talk about today. And bold, not only bold flavors, but bold colors. You know, the old salad doesn't have to be boring anymore. There's lots of fun stuff that we can put in salads that are good for us and add eye appeal as well. The second thread that we're going to talk about is a really fun crop of essence called Roots to Shoots. And what that means is um, a plant now does double duty or triple duty. Used to be we grow broccoli and we just cut the tops off and harvest the rest, throw it into the compost pile. Now, if you go around the promenade, you'll see not only do they use the broccoli flower itself, but we're now taking the stems and using those in salads. We, ju we had julienne that. Here's one called Asper Brock. It's fairly new to the market. So normally we would just go ahead and use the top and eat that. But now because these beautiful, long, tender stems that have been developed by the growers can be used just like asparagus. So roots to shoots. We're going to talk about lots of different things. What about, what about beets? Used to be we only eat the roots. But now the hybridizer creates these wonderful colors of these beets that can be eaten raw in salads. So roots to shoots. So that'll be a common theme through the next two or three hours. You thought you were getting away, didn't you? So the question is, what can I grow? Well, if you're fortunate to love enough to live here in Central Florida, you can grow anything. You can stand back and watch it grow. I've, I haven't seen it, but we have bamboo at Lou Gardens that grows six to seven inches a day. Now, we don't want your vegetables to grow quite that fast, <laughs> but what can you grow? You can grow anything you want. I really encourage you, if this is the first time that you're trying to grow vegetables, that you start out with something easy, something that you personally like to eat, and then as you gain success with those plants, then you, you can build on that and then try some other things as well. So let's look at some really easy plants to start with. So if you've never gardened before, or if you're interested in tuning up your gardening skills, these are some plants that you might want to think about. What about lettuce? There are so many different varieties of lettuce on the market today. As I said, the lettuce, the salad doesn't have to be bold, it doesn't have to be green anymore. Have you ever seen any of these at the grocery store? That's why you grow your own. For diversity, for color, for flavor. 
These are all seeds that I planted four weeks ago. So these are things that you can plant in containers, you can plant in your garden. What to grow? Easy things. Really, really easy things. Look at how beautiful this is. This is a variety called Cherokee. Isn't that the most beautiful thing? Imagine that in your salad when you sit down for dinner. We love sweet peas. You know, the sugar snap peas are so easy to grow. There are some that get about five feet tall and you can grow them next to a wall or grow them on a fence. And I can tell you, it is a great way to introduce young people to gardening. I have four children, and when they would get come off the bus, they would run from the bus, run through the house, and they would run to the vegetable garden and eat snow peas. I never had a snow pea make it into the house until he left to get married. <laughs> and he would call me about this time of year. So, Dad, how are those snow peas coming? Well, you know, Brendan, I just didn't grow any snow peas this year. <laughs> Dad, what are the snow peas? All right, they're ready right now. Come here. <laughs> Coming at them. What a great way to introduce children to vegetables. You can, when they're young, you can use them as snow peas and stir fry. Older, you can eat the pot and all, or later you can harvest them. Very easy plant to grow. Not a lot of effort as long as they get plenty of full sun. Beans. One of the great things about what's happening in gardening today is if you're, okay, and you see this? This is your responsibility. This is my clicker. So everyone in this room is depending on you to keep track of this for me. Got it? Got it. Okay. So, look at this beautiful cup. Isn't that cute? Yeah. My daughter bought me a set of four of these for Christmas. And I said, what can I put in these? Why not plant some vegetables? So look at this plant. This is really unusual. This is new on the market. And it's a good example of growers who are now producing seeds for people who don't have gardens, big gardens. They want to grow them in containers. This is a variety called Mascot. And the great thing about Mascot is developed for containers so that the flowers are on top of the plant. Did you notice that? Usually the beans are up underneath. The flowers are in there, so you have to lift them up and look. And you know, when you pick them, you're probably going to harm the plant, so you may get one, maybe two harvests. But now, because they've developed these, the flowers are on top, the beans are going to be on top. And these are full-size beans. These are five to six inches long. Unlike those that you get in the grocery store, it says fresh produce up there. Some of those beans can be 14 to 21 days old after picking. And one of the reasons we grow vegetables is for nutrition. Five days after you pick a green bean, it's already lost 50% of its nutritive value. So don't you want to grow your own on your, pat on your terrace or your patio or maybe in the ground? It's wonderful. There's another new variety that we like too. And this again is root to shoots. You know, we're finding different things, different reasons, different ways to use plants that we've just sort of used one way before. So that is so cute. Look at those little carrots in there, huh? Isn't that nice? Same cheese cup set, pretty sweet, yeah. So these are carrots growing in here. The nice thing about these carrots is they were designed specifically for containers. So you don't have a lot of space. You're not going to get nine, ten inch long carrots. You're going to get carrots that are half inch in diameter and two inches long. It's called little fingers. Is that the cutest thing? Okay. So, and, and then on the tops, if any of you have ever made pesto before, you put in basil, you put in parsley, try lettuce or uh, carrot leaves instead of the parsley. And I think you're going to really be surprised how flavorful and how fresh it is. The difference between stuff that you buy at the store to the stuff that you bring in from the house is five minutes earlier is night and day. So that's a great way to use carrots, not only for the carrots, but also for the tops as well. Okay. Let's see another easy plant. Is there an easier plant in the world than radishes? These are all different kinds of radishes. Last year at Lou Gardens, we 
we tried 20 different varieties of radishes and that's just a small sampling of some of them. The reason we like them is because they're colorful. They add color and flavor to a fresh fruit plate. So if you're having friends over before the Super Bowl, and I know you all have fresh vegetables for those guys, you know, dipping them in ranch, but right? <laughs> Maybe not. But anyway, so you create a nice vegetable plate with some ranch dressing. You go to the grocer and you say, you know, I'm having some people over and I'd like to create a nice vegetable plate for a dip uh, as an appetizer. And I, when can I expect the Spanish black radishes to arrive? That's the Spanish black in the upper left-hand corner of that picture. Chances are that grocer doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. So we grow 20 different kinds just to see how they would do. Every, warm, every one of them performed extremely well. So there's another way to grow radish seeds too. Oh, look at that. That is so Martha, isn't it? <laughs> Going in there. And, you know, clearly you cannot grow these in just white eggs. You have to use brown eggs, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So, radishes were planted on Monday morning. They will germinate in three to four days. That's why we really enjoy using these when we help young people grow their very first garden. Because sometimes we get a little impatient and we're looking for something that's going to give you instant gratification. Radishes will do this. So what do we have now? We have microgreens. So you put a nice salad together with the, all the different colors of the salad that we showed you and then you simply snip these off and put those on the salad. I have 11 more that I can choose from. Now what do I do this when I snip those off? I throw it in the garden, right? It's an eggshell, it's calcium, there's a little potting soil in there. So when people say, Robert, this gardening thing is so complicated. I go into the store, go to a bookstore, there's four or five books on growing vegetables. There's magazine articles on growing vegetables. Someone yesterday said, oh, it's really hard to grow vegetables. It really takes concentration. This is food. Let's not make it really complicated. It's easy. So start with one of those plants that grow well for you and then build on those experiences, all right? It's not that complicated. It's not that hard. We really want you to try the easy things and then keep going and see how well you do. What about kale? Kale is one of the four major superfoods in the world. Very high in vitamin K. This happens to be an ornamental variety of kale. And one of the most often asked questions, like, can you eat that? You bet you can. Now this is great if you live in a homeowner's association because they see it as a flower and you're eating it as food, but they don't have to know. <laughs> now it's important that when you use kale, whether it's big leafy kale or ornamental kale like this, when you use it in soups and you use it in salads, if you want the maximum benefit from that, the fiber that's in that, it's really important that you break that fiber down with your fingers before you put it into a salad or before you put it in soup. You have to break that fiber down to make it available. If you put it in a smoothie, it doesn't make any difference. It'll do it all by itself. But kale is a wonderful plant, easy to grow. Have you ever heard the, you ever heard the term, ah, oh, to come up like turnips, right? You heard that? That's how easy it is. Plant one single seed, you'll get a beautiful plant like this in 60 days. Not too hard, grows in full sun as well. We already talked about carrots. Is there an easier plant? Now, we, let's jump back just a little bit to the radish. Carrots, unfortunately, can take three to four weeks to germinate from seed. And I don't know about you, but when I get into the garden, sometimes I get into this planting frenzy. And I've just got packages of seeds and I can't have an empty row. I have got to have everything full and ready. It's just, and then after I plant the beans a few days later, the carrots start coming up <laughs> where the beans were. Oh yeah, I planted carrots there. So how do you prevent that from happening? Plant your carrots. They're going to take three to four weeks. 
starting out at the beginning of the row, every 12 inches, put a single seed of radish. Radish germinates in three days. Use the radish as a marker where you have something planted. And then, when that radish is ready to be harvested in 30 to 40 days, you simply pull that radish out. By that time, the carrots have come up and you know they're there. So we use it for food, but we also use it for those of us, none of you, but those of us who are somewhat absent-minded and forget where they put stuff, like clickers and stuff. Yeah. What about potatoes? That's an easy plant too. This is one of my favorite plants. You hold on to this. I'll put it right there. I love this plant. It's so easy to grow. So here we are with just a regular bushel basket. Get it to store four bucks. Take a little piece of potato. You probably have a sprouting potato somewhere in the garage, right? <laughs> Oh, you know, I've been meaning to get rid of that. So you put a little piece of it in the bottom of this, right in the center. Cover that with a half inch of soil. It sprouts out of that dirt. So then you put a little more soil in it. It's higher. What we're doing is that we're making contact with the soil to the stem of the potato. And eventually it's going to get all the way to the top. You have to stop, obviously. But it's where the contact of the stem and the soil happens, begins to, this is so heavy. I should put it down, huh? It's that contact of the soil and the stem that makes the potatoes, because they'll start to produce roots from the stem, and it's a tip of those roots is where they make the potato. So, at the end of 45 to 60 days, maybe even a little bit longer, they'll start to flower. They'll let you know that they're ready down below. You can dump that out and get a couple dozen potatoes out of a single basket. That's pretty easy, easy to grow and easy to get a hold of because you probably have some of it already at home. That shoulder will never be the same. <laughs> and last but not least are herbs. One of the things that we went through when we were discussing this program over the three-day period at the opening weekend, well, what kind of herbs are we going to grow? We one of those are going to be tough, they're going to be really good plants for you to grow in your garden without much help, and that's what we've got. You have chives, you have lavender, you have flat-leaf parsley out there. What else do we have? Greek oregano, all really easy plants to grow, and can grow in a wide range, a wide variety of containers, so we'll, we're going to do that really well. Where are they going to grow? Number one, eight hours of full sun, period. Don't, don't go less. When you pick up a book or a magazine, inevitably you're going to find a little box. And the headline will say, hey, look at all these vegetables you can grow in the shade. Do not fall for that, because vegetables need full, hot, blazing sun. Anything short of that, they're going to be under stress. And when plants are under stress, the bugs and diseases just swarm in, and you're going to be fighting them for the rest of the life of that plant. So minimum eight hours of full sun. But gosh, you know, Robert, I live on a, I live in an apartment. I have a patio. I don't have eight hours of full sun. So here we have a nice chili pepper. But can I tell you a funny story about these? We, uh, Disney hires about 40, 45 horticultural intern students from universities all over the world. And they're trained to do a wide number of tasks. You saw some earlier as hosts and handing out paper. Little did they know when they went to college, they would be diving into dumpsters <laughs> at Walt Disney were looking for planting containers for Robert's presentation. <laughs> so right now, they're not real keen on me. But so here we have a nice pepper plant. And so I live on a patio, what do I do? To turn it around. 
All of a sudden, this side's getting full sun. Well, I guess I could do that. That's not too hard. So here's just a regular container, a soup container of what, how many? Nine pounds of cherry or, or uh, paste tomatoes came on that. But you can grow them anywhere. It doesn't make any difference. As long as they get eight hours of full sun, that's really important. How do I grow seeds or plants? Do I buy the plants? All right, let's think about this. Let's think this through. So I go to the store, go to a garden center, I go to a feed store, and I buy a little pack of six plants, usually for about $4. Or, worse yet, you buy one of those little peat cups for $3.50 for one plant. I went by a store to buy, to, to buy some sweet potatoes, actually. Any potatoes in a, in a whole, I didn't say whole, I mean an or, uh, organic store that produces organic vegetables. And you can use those potatoes as seed potatoes because they haven't been sprayed with a root hormone that prevents them from sprouting. So those are really good. You don't have to buy expensive ones over the internet. You can go to a, a store. However, I went into this store, which shall remain nameless, Whole Foods, and I, and as I was walking down the produce section, I saw this number and I just simply couldn't believe it. I took a double take. Seven dollars and ninety-five cents for six beets. Now I love beets. I can sit in front of the TV and eat a whole jar of beets. As you can see, I've done it more than once. But. <laughs> I can buy a package of 250 seeds for $2.95, and every one of those seeds will produce a bee. In fact, a member of that family, Swiss chard beets, a member of a special family, for every seed you produce, there's actually three or four plants in that. So you plant one seed, you're going to have to take other two so you only have one. So you'll have to thin from a single seed. So the other, that's the economy side. That's the frugal side of why you want it, why I grow from seed. But more importantly, I think the reason I grow from seed is I know now when I take that seed out of the package and plant it into my soil, water with my water, harvest it and take it into the house, I know what my family is eating. I know it's going to be safe and it's going to be a, a, a high flavor. You buy something in the store, you don't know where it's been, you don't know what it's been sprayed with or how it's been handled. So the question is, do you buy seed, do you buy plants? What I try to do in these presentations is to lay out the facts and then let you decide. The same thing with insecticides and fertilizers and pesticides. I'll lay it out and then it's personal choice for you. But in my world, it's all about the seeds. And as you can see, you don't need fancy stuff to grow seeds. This, how easy is this? So here, what about that? I'm not allowed to say toilet paper. So this is a paper towel roll. And I've cut it off into two inch pieces. You cut uh, um, lines in the bottom and you fold them in there and you plant a plant. So you don't need fancy stuff. And what do you do with this? You plant the whole thing right in the ground. So do you need to go to the store and buy all these fancy things? No, you've got them hanging around the house. What about the bean itself? Oh, well, you know, you go, I have to go to a garden center or I have to get them online. Why don't you go to the grocery store and go to the soup aisle. They have bags of pinto beans, black-eyed peas, kidney beans, right? They have all that. Plant those. Wait a minute, you can't plant those, those are soup beans. They can't do anything to them, they're seeds that you have to eat. So they haven't been treated, you can plant those. So when you go to the store, buy a bag of 
2,000 seeds. <laughs> You'll have seeds the rest of your life and then store them in the vegetable crisper of your refrigerator. They'll last you five or six years. But the same soup beans that you buy in the store, the same soup, same beans you're going to grow and put in your soup later. They'll grow. So seeds are pretty important, I think. And I try to grow the seed whenever I possibly can. What kind of soil do I use? The soil that you have on your table in front of you is a great combination of peat moss, pine bark, and that black, that white stuff is perlite, and there may even be some vermiculite in there. All organic. This is great for sowing seeds and growing plants in containers. We do not recommend that you use garden soil to grow the seeds because there's lots of things in there that could damage the little seedlings when they're young. So we recommend potting soil. When you're growing outside, whatever soil you have that you can improve with organic matter by adding oak leaves and compost, whatever you've got, anything that's going to increase the water holding and hence the nutrient holding capacity of that soil is going to be the kind of soil you're looking for. So in Lou Gardens 10 years ago when we started creating this wonderful vegetable garden, our soil was as white as the paper in front of you. It was white beach sand. That's where we live in Florida. Some of these areas were never underwater and so we have soil that's, that's primarily white beach sand and then two feet below that is yellow builder sand. So it drains very well, but it doesn't hold on to nutrients and it doesn't hold on to the water. So you need to do something to add to that to make sure that it holds some water for at least a short period of time so the roots have the ability to absorb it before it races on by. Now in containers, because this is fairly sterile, there's no nutrients in there. So you're going to have to apply some nutrients. You can do that organically by adding organic things like blood meal and uh, plant tone is an organic fertilizer, or you can go synthetic. Again, I'm laying out the, the facts for you. You can personally decide how you want to do it. Synthetic isn't bad, and I use from time to time, especially in containers, those fertilizers that when you water, it releases a little bit of fertilizer every time you water. That way you're not having to put the blue powder in the watering can and adding water and fertilizing. Every time you water, it releases a little bit of fertilizer. So that's a good way to do it. In my family, it doesn't seem to affect me at all that I've used that on my vegetables. Okay? But for fertilizer, when in containers, you have to remember because there's no soil no native soil in there, you have to use a complete fertilizer. And that means numbers in the N, P, and K that are on the front bag or in the, on the bottom. When you're in the ground here in Florida, especially Central Florida, because we already have phosphorus in the soil, you're looking for a number in the N category, which is nitrogen. So you see N, P, K in a bag, right? The N is nitrogen, it makes things grow. That's all it does. Middle number is phosphorus, that's for flowers and fruit. Well, Robert, I should be adding that because if I'm growing vegetables, that should be flowers and fruit. It's already there. I've taken hundreds of soil samples when I, when I came to Florida and never has my native soil required phosphorus. And if you do add it, it leaches through the soil very quickly and ends up in our lakes and streams anyway. So let's not use it. You don't need it. And then the last one is K. That's potassium, and that's for strong roots and stems. So a good fertilizer for outdoors in the ground would be 15, 0, 15, or something in that ratio. But keep in mind, when you're using garden soil, soilless mix, like you have on the, on the table here, you're going to need a complete fertilizer. Okay? How do I feed my plants? I just told you that. I got one, one slide ahead, didn't I? You want to feed a little bit often. 
That's the important thing. Someone came to me during break and said, I had this plant and I put this fertilizer on it and I think it's dead. Well, how much did you put on? Well, what she put on was way too much. I'm not gonna, and I'm not gonna point you out right now either. But it was way too much. If you don't like eating one big meal a day and then spend the rest of the day hungry, plants are the same way. Every time you water, you add a little fertilizer. That's what the, the uh, slow release fertilizer is really good. Or you can add the powder and, and in the garden, you probably want to add that every three to four weeks. Now, as I said earlier, I'm from Ohio and there's a lot of clay up there. And when you add fertilizer, you really only need to add it once a year because the clay particles bind all the fertilizer together and it holds nutrients so the roots can get to it. Here, water is a passing fancy. I mean, you add it and the sugar sand where I live in Longwood, just 10 miles from here, and the water goes right on through and the next day, I have to water again. If you look at that dirt under a microscope, it's little rocks. There's nothing to hold the water in place. So anything you can do to increase the, the capacity of water is great, but slow release works even better, all right? Because it, it's a little bit off and that's what the plants really seem to like. And how often do I water? If you remember nothing else from the presentation today, vegetables don't like to be dry. They don't like to wilt. Usually you say wilting is not a bad thing. If your plant starts to wilt, you water it, you haven't heard anything. But once a cucumber or a zucchini starts to wilt and you have to rehydrate it, it's going to take a couple weeks for that plant to come back to start to produce fruit again especially zucchini and cucumbers. So it's important that you don't overwater so everything is squishy, but you don't want it so dry that we're getting wilt. It really needs to be moist, and there's only one way to do it. My father used to tell me the secret to a green thumb is brown knees. You need to get down your hands and knees and test that soil with your finger. Well, that's pretty moist, that's good. You want to keep that soil moist as often as you can. So when someone comes and say afterwards, well, how often should I water? I don't know what your garden looks like. I don't know whether it's sugar sand or whether it's mucky soil like we have in South Orlando. If it's mucky soil, you don't need to water but every three or four days. If you live in sandy soil, it could be every day, maybe twice a day, depending how hot it gets. What about the bugs? Oh my goodness sakes. Everything you've heard about bugs in Florida is true. But they're worse than that. I'll tell you how to keep bugs away from your garden though. Keep your plant healthy. Healthy plants do not get sick. Wait a minute. What about rose bushes? You know, they're gonna get black spot, right? What about St. Augustine grass? They're going to get chinch bugs. They're going to get sun. So there are exceptions to the rule. But generally speak, speaking, if you can keep your plants healthy, a little bit of fertilizer often, moist soil, and full sun, eight hours, you won't get bugs. And if you do get them, they're going to be so few that you can take care of them with something as simple as a, as a a spray from your garden hose to wash them away. Some, some of us have aphids. Usually the aphids are on the top of the new growth. It's nice and tender. And those guys are sucking all that juice out of the new growth. And as that plant begins to expand, those leaves start to curl and crumble up a little bit. That's aphid damage. They've sucked all the juice out. So how do you get rid of those? Well, the first thing I think right away is I go, you know, go to my garden shed because I got stuff that'll kill stuff in there. And if you're anything like my wife, you know, when she sprays a bug, she wants to see that bug flip over on its back and do one of these, you know? She's a hard woman. Yeah. Aphids. Really simple. Take that car wash nozzle you have, go out into the garden. Be careful not to blow the plant away, but you want to wash those aphids off. 
Robert, they're gonna they're gonna crawl back. No, they're too dumb. <laughs> I don't know why, but they will not crawl back. So you just wash them off. Sometimes you may have a big leaf. You need to hold the leaf and wash it. But that's all you do. You don't need to go to the shed. You don't need to go to the store and buy all this fancy stuff for aphids. You just wash them away. That is one stupid bug. That's all I can say. <laughs> but aren't we lucky? Now there's other things that may happen. There may be worms. Butterflies fly by and they're going to lay eggs and they're going to get worms from those. Go into your kitchen. Under the sink, find a bottle of ivory soap, liquid ivory soap. Tablespoon to a quart of water. You go out to your yard and spray the bugs with the ivory soap. Works every time. We don't recommend oil. Some people say put a little oil in there. But if you do that, when the temperatures are very hot, you're going to burn your plants. So tablespoon to a quart of water and just spray it. Make sure you get the undersides because that's where the bugs hide sometimes. And there are other things that will kill bugs too that are safe for people. Keep in mind, again, for the same reasons we grow from seed, the same reasons we want to use pesticides very carefully. And so if you use something as simple as ivory soap or neem oil, N-E-E-M, it's another good organic insecticide, which also acts as a fungicide, that's a safe product to use. But if you keep your plants healthy, chances are you won't need to control your bug. Okay? How do I know when to harvest? There is a fellow right here yesterday morning I said, how do you know when to harvest? Do you know what his response was? When I'm hungry. <laughs> That's when I harvest. You know what I got to thinking about? It, I think I was right. Because I'm out in the garden. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I have forgotten to have lunch. Have you ever done that? I know it doesn't look like I've forgotten any lunches. But... So I forgot lunch. What do I do? I wander over to the cauliflower and take a little piece off. Wow. It tastes like candy. It's sweet. It's tender. It doesn't taste like the cauliflower you get in the store. Remember, that cauliflower could be three weeks old, 21 days, since that thing has been living on a plant. It's going to turn hard. It's going to taste like cardboard. You pick that off, and we do this in the garden. We, we, it's 100% organic. People will come by, wow, look at that purple cauliflower. I've never grown a cauliflower before like that. We, pick a piece off and give it to them. Oh, you know, I really don't like cauliflower. <laughs> but we give it to them, they put a bit in their mouth, it's sweet, it's tender. Wow, can I have some more of that? You sure can. I got them hooked now. They're gonna grow cauliflower when they get home. So when do you harvest? Before, the, before they start to open, like on the asperbrock or on the broccoli and some of those, you wanna you want to harvest them when before the flowers open up. And that's what you're eating, right? Is the flower head. But now we're also going to select the stems and the leaves to eat as well. Cabbage, carrots, beans. You can pick those at any time in their growth cycle if you want them, if you want to grow them. Instead of letting those beans and that mascot um, container to grow to full five or six inches, you can pick them when you're three or four. They're going to be more tender. They're going to be more flavorful. So pick them anytime you want. Uh, and make sure you pick them just before you plan to use them. You know, my mother used to tell me that well, you would pick corn when the pot is boiling on the stove. <laughs> and she's right about that. We take that one step further. When you, when you have a plant and you're going to transplant it to another location, you always dig that hole first. And then when you dig that plant, you immediately move it to the hole that you've already done. Otherwise, you're going to be digging a hole and this plant's out of the ground. So dig that hole first. Have the water boiling when you pick that corn. That's when you're going to get the maximum benefit out of those vegetables. Okay, let me tell you how this is going to work. Thank you very much, by the way, for your attention. Ah, go ahead. You have a pot. Let's put on your gloves. 
you have a nice, beautiful clay pot in front of you. You have a soilless mix in front of you. I would suggest that you take a little bit of that soil and you fill that pot about halfway up. Then you simply take that plug and you rest it on top of that soil. And then you hold on to that plant so it stands up and you very carefully put soil around the edge. Do not press that soil down with your fingers. Once you put that soil around the outside, tap it a little bit. What we're trying not to do is to compact that soil around that plug. We want that water to flow through freely and the only way to do that is not to compress it. So you want to do this at home too when you're transplanting. A little bit of dirt, put the plug in, put a little soil around. When you tap it, that soil is going to go down a little bit. Then put a little bit more. But do not press it down with your fingers because you're really creating a compacted soil which isn't good for the plant. But 